Um, good evening, everyone. Let's, um, let's make a start. Um, my name's Emily Andrews. I'm a senior researcher here at the Institute. Thank you all very much for coming along for what I hope will be a lively discussion this evening. Um, when Joe's publishers got in touch with us uh, last year to discuss um, if we might want to run an event around these questions, if that would be interesting to us, it felt quite timely. Um, of course, the second to last event, which brought the status of economic claims um, and economists into public contention, was of course the economic crash of the last decade, the financial crash, um, which provided the catalyst for the movement um, which Joe is part of. And of course now we have Brexit, which has once again brought economic claims into public contention um, in a similar but perhaps even more fractious way. Um, so that kind of provides a hook for this evening's discussion, but also um, let's be clear from the beginning that economists and government are doing a lot more than forecasting the potential impacts of Brexit, um, and we've got a wide variety of work represented in the room this evening, which is great. Um, I must admit to being an interloper into your ranks. I'm not an economist, I am a historian. And when you study history, um, you're not really taught the facts of history, you're just kind of supposed to work that out for yourself. What you're taught is historiography, pretty much from day one, certainly at my institution, what you did was study the different um, approaches and different narratives that different individuals and groups have taken, building on the raw material of the past. So when I took up the study of economics more recently, I was um, rather surprised to be handed a textbook um, and to find within that textbook things which struck me as being um, theoretical suppositions presented as fact. It was just um, a bit jarring. It wasn't what I was used to. And it's that kind of realisation, not, not by me, of course, but by lots of people, um, which provides the starting point for tonight's discussion. Is there a danger that one approach to economic questions gets baked into our politics and policy making? And does that actually matter? So to discuss that with us tonight, we've got Joe R, who is a founder of the Post-Crash Economic Society at the University of Manchester, uh, a founder, a founding co-chair of uh, the Trustees of Rethinking Economics, which is the international student movement that grew out of that. Um, and he's co-author of a book called The Econocracy on the Perils of Leaving Economics to the Experts, um, which has won many accolades. Uh, Chris Giles. Is, uh, has been the economics editor of the Financial Times since 2004, and he did also briefly work as uh, an official for Ofcom um, in the early noughties, but soon scuttled back to journalism. Um, and then finally, Miata von Buller, uh, who is the chief executive of the New Economics Foundation. She's worked on reshaping our economy from inside and outside government um, at NEF, also IPPR in the Leader of the Opposition's Office um, and the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit in the Cabinet Office. Um, and of course we have a kind of fourth panellist here today which is all of you. You will note that I have not been successful at persuading a government economist to come on this panel. I don't know what about that title could have put them off. Um, but um, it's really good to have so many currently practising government economists in the room and I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions and comments um, later on this evening. Um, so just finally to say that um, this uh, conversation is of course on the record, it's uh, being live streamed, we are tweeting it, you can tweet it as well with the hashtag up here, IFG Economics. Um, so on that, without further ado, Joe, I'm going to put the question to you, is it time for revolution in government economics? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in the next seven minutes, I'm going to argue that we need a pluralist revolution um, in our economic knowledge and practice, um, and that the discipline of economics has become monopolised by a perspective called neoclassical economics. Um, I'm going to kind of start by explaining what I mean there. So neoclassical economics rests upon a particular way of seeing the world. Um, economies are composed of individual agents who interact based on well-behaved rules. They function according to knowable forces and relationships, um, which mean that experts can model them and make predictions. And they are pictured as standalone systems that emerge from 
the actions of individual agents. It's a, it's a versatile perspective and over time it has incorporated you know, insights from different disciplines and um, from other branches of economics. It also doesn't require a commitment to a particular political belief um, and, and it can be kind of used to argue for a broad range of policies. Um, and to be very clear, our criticism isn't of neoclassical economics per se, because it does have many, many strengths, um, but of its intellectual and institutional monopoly, um, which we argue has many negative consequences, um, including the kind of narrowing of economic knowledge and practice in a way which reduces our collective ability to address complex and changing economic realities, um, and also kind of creating the conditions of hubris and groupthink among economists who often don't understand or acknowledge the limits of their knowledge, um, their own biases, or where there is room uh, for legitimate debate. Um, and in contrast, pluralism in economics is the belief that there isn't one single right way to study the economy because the economy itself is evolving, complex and contested. Um, and different economic perspectives, of which there are at least 11 kind of established, including Austrian, post-Keynesian, feminist, complexity economics, provide fund fundamentally different ways of thinking about the economy from the ground up. They've got different assumptions about human behavior and the role of institutions, different focuses and priorities, um, which represent value judgments about what is important. Um, and this means that they ask different questions. They use different tools and approaches which lead them to different answers. Um, they're very diverse and they're definitely not all equally valuable, but I think they do all have valuable insights. Um, and here I'll kind of take just one example. Um, so ecological economic, uh, economists dispute that ecological costs can be compared to economic costs <coughs> by, be, by being given a monetary value in cost-benefit analysis and climate models because things like the ozone layer and uh, rainforests have functions in ecosystems that can't be replaced. Therefore, they argue that policy must take into account the limitations uh, on the resources that can be extracted and waste that can be emitted while maintaining ecological stability. This approach implies that there may be physical limits to economic growth um, and has led eco ecological economists to explore how no growth economies could work. The idea that GDP growth might not be possible or even desirable is even, it's kind of hard to imagine within the bounds of our current kind of understanding of the economy. And as a result, people who argue for it are kind of often seen as idealistic or worse. Um, and I would argue that, that kind of limitation seriously kind of narrows the kinds of debates we can have. Um, in my experience, Government economists are much, much more open to the arguments for pluralism than academic economists, and I'm not just trying to butter you up. Um, because I think your work, you know, brings you into closer contact with the messy realities of the world. Um, and you're therefore more used to the kind of pluralist toolbox approach. Um, although you could, of course, prove me wrong today. Um, that being said, I think really embracing a culture of pluralism within government economics would require kind of quite fundamental changes, um, as well as structural institutional reform. Um, one of the major barriers uh, is the university economics education that shapes all new government economists. And the narrowing of economics over the last 30 years has led to a shift in the aims of economics education from understanding the way the, which the world works, which Chris Giles has written was his experience, to memorizing and regurgitating abstract kind of theory, uh, neoclassical theory. Um, and in the book, we uh, report the results of a curriculum review of seven British universities and studying 172 economics modules and looking at the final exams we found that only 22% of marks required students to demonstrate um, critical or independent thinking and this went down to 6% in core modules 48% uh, of all marks required students to operate a model 
but only 3% of these required any link to the real world. Um, Non-neoclassical perspectives were only mentioned in 17 out of 172 of the modules. And relating back to my own earlier example, only 9 of 23 Russell Group universities that teach economics provide environmental economics modules, of which none uh, mention ecological economics. Um, and I think there are, you know, broader institutional and practical barriers to a kind of real culture of pluralist economics in government. Um, the Green Book in setting out the kind of framework for the appraisal and evaluation of all government policies, programs and projects reads remarkably like a neoclassical economics textbook in places. Um, it identifies the two main rationales for government intervention in the market as efficiency and equity and specifies the use of cost-benefit analysis to determine different ways of achieving the desired outcome. Um, neoclassical framings of the economy and economic decision making are similarly embedded throughout government policies and processes, limiting the ability of government economists to employ different theories and tools when appropriate. Um, of course, there are time constraints um, and resource constraints to incorporating pluralist economics, and I think often they're, you know, some of the most serious. Um, more fundamentally, I think the, the function of economics in government is to produce kind of rigorous analysis, which kind of brings objectivity and order to what's otherwise kind of messy political decision making, um, and I think pluralist kind of economics changes that role. Um, you know, Austrian and complexity economics emphasize kind of the unknowable nature of the economic system and the inability of government to fully understand the outcomes of its decisions. Um, and I think they pose a challenge to the idea that kind of any economic framework can provide a kind of blueprint for top-down and centralised decision-making and so I guess pluralist economists must therefore realise that they cannot kind of pick out the optimal policy and must kind of give um, options and advice and I think that is a, a big kind of potentially a big change um, that might be difficult um, and I guess what then can be done to spark kind of a pluralist revolution in government economics um, and I think the civil service network exploring economics is already doing really important work kind of making the case for pluralist economics in government and creating space for economists and also non-economists to learn about and apply different economic perspectives to their work and my understanding is that that's been really widely supported um, and empowered and I think that's a big case where government economics has been different to the work we've done in, in academic economics. More broadly, I think the government economic service should work um, with pluralist economic economists to provide kind of training and resources for civil servants. Pluralist economic knowledge and skills should be incorporated into GES training and professional development, individual uh, government economists and research groups could be supported to provide economic analysis from different perspectives. Um, finally, government economists and the GES should, should support uh, efforts to reform economics curricula because I think that's, uh, you know, the supply of economists is, is really important. Um, and so there is kind of my case for revolution in government economics. Um, I hope I've convinced you at least of the need to discuss this further. Thank you. Um, so this is, I mean, the thing that we've asked you here to kind of talk about is this revolution in government economics, and you've set that out very clearly. There's something in the book, a uh, strand in your thought, which kind of goes beyond that, which is about democratising economics, which would, I guess, mean taking it out of the hands of government economics in order to make government economics better. Is that, could you say a bit more about that? Yeah, of course. Um, I think... <sighs> What we realised after two or three years of campaigning for curriculum reform is that change might help us as economists better, uh, you know, solve the, the big problems that mattered to us as individuals and, and as a generation, but we would still be a tiny minority and, um, you know, our friends and family would still kind of defer to us and say, you're an economist, what do you think? Um, and actually one of the things we wanted to do was kind of change the wider um, model of, of how economics 
and economic issues were discussed and how policy making happened. And so we started to develop that as a big part of our work as a student movement. Um, and we started to kind of develop the kind of argument. And so we did a YouGov survey in which we found that kind of 61% um, of the 1,500 people we surveyed couldn't pick the definition of GDP, 70% quantitative easing, 46% the budget deficit. And so we started to kind of realize how split the kind of country had become between people who are in the economic club and people who are outside. Um, one of the kind of interesting things was that 40%, 47% of respondents stated that they talked about economics once a month or less. Um, and I kind of feel like it's very likely that those people, you know, talked about economic issues, <coughs> they talked about work or healthcare or education, but they didn't identify it as economics. Um, and another really interesting um, PhD thesis um, which includes interviews with residents of one of um, the largest housing estates in North London found that kind of people's attitudes towards the economy ranged from it being completely distant and irrelevant to it being a kind of way that elites exercised power over them and, and domination over them and showed a, a real breakdown of, of trust um, which of course is is echoed more widely um, in the EU referendum and so kind of our argument is that we need a revolution in the public understanding of and participation in economic policy making on the basis that it will strengthen both its quality and its kind of legitimacy um, and we've um, set up a charity called Economy which campaigns for economics education in schools, provides crash courses in communities um, and runs an economics news and current affairs website for people who hate economics. Um, the RSA have done some great work um, with a citizens economic council which gave a group of citizens a critical economics education and asked them to agree on some collective economic priorities and policies and the Bank of England has recently agreed to one of the RSA's recommendations to set up assistance reference panels across the 12 regions it has local agents in. Um, and I think the RSA make three further recommendations in their great kind of report at the end of this programme, which, if properly implemented, would kind of equate to a revolution in government economics. Um, and I've got them here because I think they're worth um, sharing. Um, so these are the, the Treasury and other economic policy making departments should commission citizens reference panels for major economic decisions and publish the results of the panel's deliberations. <coughs> Um, that national and local government should expand the use of open data and online data tools to allow public scrutiny of economic data and provide resources to civil society organisations to provide independent analysis of policy. Um, and then finally, the creation of an expert resource centre on participatory economics within government, um, drawing upon a range of public engagement and participation techniques um, so that policymakers can best understand when and what uh, context deliberative forms of engagement uh, with the public are most appropriate and necessary and I think for me um, from a point in which three or four maybe a bit longer years ago these kinds of issues weren't really up to my knowledge on the agenda I think now there is a real kind of impetus and momentum behind them and so I think that's quite exciting. <coughs> Um, okay, I'm going to come to Chris now then. So we've heard a case there for pluralism in government economics and for engaging the public in economic two policy revolutions. making. <laughs> two revolutions, not that's two Sorry. more than I think there's ever been on this stage. Uh, Chris, what are your thoughts? Uh, thank you. Well, you're never going to get a, an employee of the Financial Times calling for a revolution. That, that, <laughs> that's, that's just... Okay. Uh, and I'm not going to disagree, I am going to disagree with Joe uh, in quite a lot of areas, but not for the sake of it. Um, and I'm going to first of all talk about the things we uh, agree about. Um, I'm going to just read you one little bit of the book, which is an exam question from an unnamed university. It was always, oh no, it's an LSE, sorry, it is, it is <laughs> um, 
Consider a two-period economy in which the representative consumer maximises the lifetime utility function u bracket c sub uh, 1 comma c sub 2 equals u bracket c 1 plus 1 plus t b to u bracket c 2 subject to the lifetime budget constraint blah de blah uh, and then it goes on that you have to have known that model and then just parrot it out and you've learnt it by off by rote. This is shocking, this doesn't, is not an intellectual exercise and I think universities, I think everything in this book is a must read for uh, parts of Britain's universities where they are testing students on that sort of knowledge rather than on the sort of question that I had which would be along the lines of inflation is always and everywhere a monetary ph phenomenon, full stop, discuss. You could, you could use any economics you liked in that question and answer, uh, where you could do it entirely mathematically, some people did, they often got firsts, uh, because it's, very, it's a very pure answer, or you could do it as an entirely an essay-based answer with no maths, n no Greek letters whatsoever. It was up to you to find a way of answering that sort of question. A much more, I'd say, testing intellectual framework uh, in universities, and uh, one where you have to bring in not only the regurgitating of the model, but also criti critiques of it and what might be right or wrong with it. And I think it's a great shame that e uh, university economics, particularly at undergraduate level, has moved down the line that Joe and his colleagues have exposed really rather effectively. Um, there's some elements of, of teaching universities I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend. Having sat through a whole lecture course on Schraffer, the production of commodities by means of commodities, uh, where that was taught as if it was truth, is just as bad as uh, going to one where the neoclassical model in its most mainstream form is taught of as a, as a pure truth. And of course, within each type of uh, uh, sort of discipline or framework or uh, the, the categories that Joe was talking about, there are many, many divergent views. So there, it is a little bit like a people's front of Judea type of, uh, when, you start, when you start classifying views very, very tightly. So I would worry about that. But I think people should have a much broader education in economics and that would sort out a lot of the problems, particularly at undergraduate level. But th but then the, the question is, is there, does this move over to society and to government? And I think it's more interesting because this is where I think I begin to disagree uh, a little bit more with what Joe was talking. I think economics is properly part, a central part of public policy. Uh, I don't uh, think when you don't take economics seriously, uh, you're doing public policy very well. And I don't accept at all that economics gives you simple or, or neoclassical economics gives you a simple answer to every question which, which is stemmed from the assumptions it made. Generally it gives you trade-offs uh, and it then asks policymakers to choose what sort of trade-off do you want. You can spend more now, for example, but then you might have to think about the consequences of, of rising public debt and then you can have a long argument about what are the relativities between those two things. You can limit low-skill immigration, but who picks the fruit? And what about demand in coastal communities? Uh, the bigger problem I see in the economics and society isn't that we've gone down the route of having one dominant culture which gives monolithic answers. It's actually that we have a load of terrible economics out there, uh, which is rather like um, is, is driving out a lot of the good stuff. So in Brexit, we have awful economics presented as mainstream and put on a lot of media and fed to the public as if it, as if it was in any way realistic. It's, a, it's not about the models that are used, it's about the assumptions that are put into the models. And if you put into a model the assumption that nothing bad can happen and only good things, not surprisingly, you are going to get the, that Brexit in, the, in that framework, it looks very good. Equally the other way around is equally the case, but you've got to think about the assumptions going in. Uh, one of the, there's a lot of very bad use of statistics, and here I'm going to pick you up, Joe, because in here you have a very bad use of statistics, which uh, I felt it was remiss of me not to point out. Uh, you or your colleagues wrote that in 2014, 
the government was obliged by European statute to add drug dealing and sex work to the audit measurements of GDP. That was great for us journalists because it just meant a really boring GDP revision story could be literally <laughs> sexed up. Um, and, and this added about 10 billion to the UK's annual GDP. And then you say growth in 2014 was 2.6% and the media reported it as the fastest growth since 2007. But this picture would have looked very different without the measurement changes. No, it wouldn't because the measurement changes went in every year. It, it didn't change the it didn't change the growth rate one bit. We just got really excited about it because it allowed us to write about something that we don't normally write about. But it, growth in 2014 was the fastest since 27 because it was the fastest since 27. And it, you just made a mistake of a levels versus change effect to the GDP statistics. Now, your reference there was the BBC, which you got the, uh, that from, which I think tells you more about the BBC and its uh, coverage of some economic things than what is real. I, haven't, I didn't go and check whether they made that mistake or whether it was just you. Um, anyway, <laughs> economics in government. Now, clearly, economics in all spheres, particularly in public life, had a very troubled time in the run-up to the crisis and not necessarily in dealing with the crisis, it did rather well there, but in then dealing with its own failings uh, before the crisis, in, particularly within government. It was quite a fun time in 2010, 2011, 2012 when you'd get the Bank of England saying, well, we have learned our lessons, but Treasury and the guest of government, they just haven't, they haven't done any serious work on what, what they got wrong. And then Treasury then, in fact, commissioning a report into uh, its own behaviour by Sharon White, who now runs Ofcom, and then saying gleefully, obviously off the record, that... Uh, We've done our own, we've cleared up our mess, and now look at the Bank of England, what have they done? Not very much. Uh, and, and, and there, and there, is a, there was a quite a lot of uh, hubris and groupthink within uh, government, uh, particularly macroeconomics, before the crisis. And that, I think, has gone away to a large extent. Now, that's got something that will probably come, uh, something that will come back to haunt me. But more importantly, uh, most of economics in government isn't that sort of, isn't susceptible to that sort of problem. Most of it uh, is, uh, isn't taking sort of big theories like where the Bank of England thought that financial, uh, a financial crisis essentially couldn't happen and so it wasn't worth looking at system-wide financial fragility. That is quite an unusual episode in government economics. Something that's more common is what, are, what is well known as policy-based evidence making, where, where the government has a policy and then gets its government economists to find reasons to justify that. Grammar schools recently was, uh, was an area there, but you can find lots of um, other problems like that. Uh, but I think generally in, in government uh, there is now a much greater understanding of what we do and don't know, and an understanding of how to try and answer a policy question giving, giving trade-offs. I mean, in the spring statement we had just last week in the OBR's document, I mean, he, I've, I've counted how many times the word uncertain or, un, or, a very, or highly uncertain was used. I mean, just as a raw poll, under 50? 50 to 100 times or over 100 times? What, what, do, what do people think? Under 50? <laughs> over 100? But in between, you know, people are quite shy. But they, you're right, over 100, 103 times, uh, highly uncertain. So they, the OBR was very, very clear about what it didn't know. And this document, the EU exit analysis, cross Whitehall briefing, the famous very, very secret document that uh, <laughs> came up with exactly the same answer as the public treasury document almost uh, beforehand, is actually a very good piece of work. And it, you know, in terms of telling policymakers and ministers what is important, you just have to go to this chart here, which says, look, you know, we don't know what you're going to go for, which model of Brexit you're going to go for. It's all a bit of a bad idea, but you've decided to do it. This is what matters, this orange bar, this is what's creating in our model the losses, this is the non-tariff barriers, so this is what you need to think about really hard. That's all the economics is telling you, it's not telling you anything more, don't worry about the 8, 5 and 2%, you know, that's highly uncertain. But it's saying that we think that is the uh, thing that you need to think about, and that's what economics in government done well, I think, does. Now, just to, to challenge uh, uh, 
So what are the challenges that economics and government? I'm glad you mentioned the Bank of England setting up a lay council. Andy Haldane, the chief economist at the bank, said he's, a, he's, he's confident that our view of the economy and our setting of economic policy will be greatly enhanced by this wider panorama. I'm not so sure about these sorts of things. This is about, you know, it's hard to say we don't want more democracy in policy making or, and it doesn't make you very popular. But unless this is a compulsory thing like jury service, you are going to get uh, just the usual suspects turning up at these lay councils. So you're either going to have an almighty people with chips on their shoulder and certain hobby horses using it as an opportunity to uh, express those views that you already know, or you're going to find people where the Bank of England's economists can easily talk them around and they'll just agree with whatever the Bank of England policymakers think, so the bank can then use it as a PR exercise, saying, well, we've taken this to our 12 <coughs> regional councils, and then they all agree with us, so why are you challenging us? Which, let's say, does happen, and Mark Carney did do this exactly after he introduced forward guidance with businesses. Uh, so that does happen. I think there's lots of challenges, uh, you know, monetary policy, we don't have a good idea how uh, that is working, or what even what effect interest rates have on the economy. Uh, our statistics are, in off, are often deficient. Uh, and so just to sum up, I, I would say, I think this idea that there's a monolithic view is really relevant for undergraduate courses in universities. I don't think it's relevant generally in universities, but for undergraduate courses it is. I don't agree it's such a large problem in government. Um, I'd love the, the public to be more engaged. It'd be great if the public was more engaged in economic issues. We obviously should get out there and try and sell good economics to the public, but at the moment I fear that actually, both in government and in, the in wider society, economists are playing defence, not offence. And the most important thing we can do is try to stop the charlatans winning. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. I, it's interesting to hear, to hear such cynicism about public engagement. I think that's maybe not what we're going to hear from Miata. Um, so I'd like to come to you now. As now a champion of the new economics, I imagine that you have in your career seen uh, quite a lot of the old economics. Um, so what is your idea of change and does it look like Joe's? Yeah, so I thought I'd provide sort of three reflections to kick off the discussion uh, tonight. I think the first is, my starting point is that I am a firm believer of evidence-based policy making. And that might be years of strategy unit induction, mm. uh, indoctrination. I'm fairly <laughs> confident it's years of strategy unit indoctrina uh, indoctrination. But I think it has a fundamental role to play um, in the way that decisions are made. Uh, so the tools and the techniques that economists bring, the ability to do effective analysis, creative modelling, to help us understand the problem, mm. to help us think about the solutions and unpick the solutions solutions, think through some of the trade-offs and to inform decision making, I think is absolutely vital in government and vital for policy making. But that takes me to my second point, uh, which is that I genuinely think that, there, that the legitimacy of this form of analysis um, is being called into question. Um, and I think that poses a massive challenge to economists both inside and outside of government. Um, and I think there are two aspects to this. Uh, on the one hand, uh, it's about the politicians. Uh, on the other, it's about the public. Um, and I think they're both incredibly corrosive to the job that economists are trying to do in government and in policy making. Um, Evidence-based policy making, I think, is fair to say, certainly in my experience in government, was more of an aspiration uh, than a full-blown reality. Um, and there's always this tension with uh, policy-based uh, evidence making, where you know, you're creating the analysis to justify a political decision or an outcome that ministers uh, want. Um, and it's always been a bit of a tussle. Um, and I think the more the legitimacy of economists, and you know, quite frankly, some of it for good reason, is quite questioned, the easier it is to dismiss the analysis and the evidence irrespective of what it tells us. Um, and I think that is a bad thing and I think that's a dangerous thing. Um, 
I think this is compounded by the public sense that, quite frankly, economists don't know what they're talking about. Um, and there's this disdain for experts that I think came to the fore in quite a visceral way during the re referendum campaign um, and in the aftermath of Brexit. And I think we all remember uh, Michael Gove's infamous uh, statement about experts. Um, and for me, I think this is possibly the part that I think is most corrosive and most worrying for economists and analysts in government. Because if your analysis isn't worth anything to the people you seek to serve, you kind of have to wonder what the point is. So I think there is a genuine crisis in economics. Uh, people use that phrase. I think it's real. Um, and its role in policy making, I think that is absolutely real as well. Um, and some of it, I think, is deserved for some of the reasons that have been talked about. Um, and I think some of it less so. Um, but that sort of takes me to the final point I wanted to make, which is that I think this crisis prevent, presents a real opportunity for us to think very differently about the role of economics and economic tools in policy making. Um, and I would start with sort of three key areas. The first is you've got to move away from analysis and indicators that focus on the aggregate macro story at the expense of capturing the nuances and the variation on the ground. Um, and for me, the spring statement was really instructive um, in this regard. So you had the Chancellor uh, sort of standing up, sprouting the sort of macro stats that tell a macro picture about growth in the economy, about employment, wages, which was a stretch, but anyway, he said it anyhow. And it feels completely dislocated from the reality of people up and down the country. Um, and, you know, for many communities, it's so far from their reality in their every day that it feels like it's completely rubbish. It feels like the numbers are made up. And they're sort of thinking, well, look, this doesn't, this doesn't make sense. These people are making this stuff up. Um, because it just doesn't speak to their experiences. And I think that dislocation and that inability to speak to the variants, to speak to the fact that London and the South East may be booming, but huge parts of the country aren't, I think is a massive, massive flaw and a challenge for economists. I think the second part, and I think it's sort of, the, the two are related, is if I reflect uh, on my entire time working in government, and we always talked about evidence-based policy making, that was the mantra, even though we didn't always achieve it, there was never an attempt to root this in people's lives and their day-to-day -day reality. Um, and, you know, we would do the analysis, clever analysis, spreadsheet, look at the data, do the literature review, do all the cool things. We would speak to experts, we'd speak to practitioners, we'd speak to lobbyists. I don't actually recall ever having spoken to a real person. Now, we're all real person, people, including myself, but actually going out there and talking to people and trying to do my problem definition that isn't just about the numbers, but tries to understand what's happening on the ground and happening to the very people we're trying to help. And I just think there is something fundamentally flawed with that sort of spreadsheet policy making. Um, and so when you think about it, it's kind of no wonder that actually many announcements, clever as they are, and you know, I produce some of them, never get past the announcement. And those that do get past the announcement are implemented, then have unintended consequences. Because if your policy is completely dislocated from the reality in the ground, then what do you expect? So I think that's a fundamental flaw in the way that we think about policy making, in the way that we do analysis. Unless we can flip it upside down, unless we can think about how you root the experiences and the reality of people's day to day in the way that we think about the numbers that we create and the analysis that we do, I think we will have a problem um, in policy making. And then that takes me to my sort of final point, uh, which is the measures of success that we use, that economists use to determine and to indeed to advise and influence ministers, um, which in truth and reality are deeply influenced by one school of thought, um, which is incredibly value driven, even though it pretends to be objective. You know, so does growth as a measure of success, does it actually matter when the majority of people aren't benefiting from it? Does employment matter if the jobs are crappy jobs, if they're not good jobs? Um, there's growth in the economy that actually completely depletes our natural resources in a way that jeopardizes future generations. Is that success? Is that a measure of success? So I think the profession needs to think long and hard um, about these sorts of questions. 
And I think if it doesn't, um, then you know, it may find itself irrelevant um, in the best case scenario and perhaps extinct in the worst case scenario. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, this is, gosh, if we want to save economists from extinction uh, or the analysis that, um, that they provide, where do you think the impetus needs to come from? Do you think it's, there's something for officials to do here or does it need to come from the political side? I think it comes from both. So I think there is a duty on officials if you want to reclaim the legitimacy of uh, the, the job you do, the profession and the service that you provide to the country. You've got to start thinking about how you change the way that, um, that, that economists provide the policy insights that inform the decisions that ministers make. Um, and then also I think it's the responsibility of people like ourselves that aren't in the game, but actually we have an influence on the debate. Mm -hmm. And the more that we can be talking about a different way of doing this, it speaks to people that kind of try to reclaim some of the legitimacy of what you know, we all believe is right, um, then I think that helps as well. Great, okay. Um, I think I'm gonna open up to the floor. Uh, I am uh, um, interested in questions. It's good we've got one already. Um, also happy to hear comments because I know we've got people um, who have kind of current experience um, in the room. If you do that, it'd be good if you keep them snappy. Um, so um, I'm going to take them in groups. We've got two questions there. It shall take one after the other. If you wait for the microphone. You go. You go. Okay. <laughs> Hi, um, Grace Lakeley from the IPPR. Um, I just wanted to take issue with the idea that um, the uh, economic models kind of give us trade-offs that are kind of objective uh, and that, um, you know, gov government officials just kind of given these and they're given the choice uh, as to how to make decisions based on that. Because obviously those trade-offs are derived from models that contain assumptions that are inherently ideological. So if we take the reason that we're saying here right now, which is, uh, I mean, largely the financial crisis, so the reason that we probably need a revolution in economics, the reason that this book was written was because economics so transparently failed to predict the, uh, the financial crisis. And that was largely because of three elements that were missing from models. So firstly, the idea that banks are just intermediaries between uh, between savers and borrowers, which is transparently not true, given their capacity to extend credit and thereby uh, impact the money supply. Secondly, um, the uh, the role of debt in the economy, and particularly the relationship between debt and class. So the fact that there are systemic differences in asset ownership between different classes, and that in turn uh, influences their marginal propensity to consume, and also their tax payments. Um, and finally, the, um, the lack of any attention to uh, the implications of financing a current account deficit through a financial account surplus, which renders us um, very vulnerable to kind of exogenous shocks um, and also creates these kind of geographical and sectoral imbalances that we've seen over the last kind of 20 years. So those kind of three examples uh, as things are excluded from, from economic models, which then give rise to trade-offs that are handed to governments as, well, you can choose to do X or Y or Z, um, all of which kind of basically state that there is no real capacity for financial crises like that, which happened in 2007, to happen, um, makes that idea that like economics just provides us with these things and it's up to politicians what to do with them seem a bit silly. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll have an opportunity to respond to that in a minute. Can we take the question next to it and then we'll take one down here. Hi, um, I'm Maeve, I'm the Director at Rethinking Economics. Um, I really enjoyed what you were saying, Mia, about speaking to people on the ground. And I think that another problem that economics has and that we really need a revolution in is the utter lack of diversity in professional economists. Um, I've got some pretty horrific statistics for you that 0.8% of um, girls who go to state schools, so state educated girls, go on to study any kind of economics at university compared to 9.8% of privately educated boys. And I think this is a, a massive issue in the discipline. And I think part of the problem is the fact that economists don't speak to people on the ground or policymakers don't speak to people on the ground. But I think another part of that is that people on the ground never become policy makers and never become economists because of um, various obstacles they face along the way. And I think that economics as a discipline has a massive job to do to, to make itself more accessible to people, not just because they should be engaging in the debates, but also because people need to understand how economics affects their lives and that they have um, the right to make um, to contribute to these debates and to be the economists and to be the policy makers and I'd like to ask the panel 
if they've got any suggestions of how economists could do better to be more relatable to people or how um, the discipline could become more attractive to um, marginalised groups. Great, okay, and one down here. Uh, Jonathan Haskell, Imperial College and uh, UK Statistics Authority. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a university economics professor, so as you can imagine, I've got a lot of investment sunk into neoclassical economics. Um, uh, so, but Joe, you know, congratulations to you for raising all of these questions. I mean, this is a fantastic thing to do, and so uh, you know, great support for doing all of that. Two things I want to say. One thing is, it does seem to me that one strength of neoclassical economics, uh, revealed by Chris Giles's question, which he read out, is the rigour that's around neoclassical economics. So I just want to challenge you a little bit about what you, uh, about whether you accept that we want to keep that rigour. So, for example, the big campaign that Chris Giles has been running in the FT about the RPI and the CPI and is it calculated right and all that kind of thing. That is just an area where we just need a lot of rigorous, you, you know, understanding and, and rigorous application of various economic forces now. Maybe there are non-neoclassical economists who are working on all of this, um, but I'm not quite sure about it. That's one thing. Second thing, very quickly, if I may, it does seem to me an interesting case study would be competition economics, where neoclassical economics, I think, has been quite respondent to changes in competitive landscapes, you know, digital economy and all that kind of thing. There's a whole apparatus that the neoclassical economics has been used to confront these types of issues. Um, and, and that does seem to be an area which precisely shows the types of trade-offs that were being talked around earlier on. If you want to, for example, set a very tight price cap on regulated firms, you're not going to get much investment. There's a trade-off right there. So again, I, I just wonder whether that might be an interesting case study uh, to look at when one looks at the strengths of the different types of approaches. Okay. Um, do you want to, should we start with Chris, maybe, I think, perhaps respond to the first point? Yes, I, I, I don't think I actually disagree as much as we, you might think I disagree. On, when I talked about generally presenting trade-offs, I think that is generally what it does, and then there can be times when it gets it horribly wrong. And we know that in the financial crisis, I wouldn't necessarily agree with your characterization of what went wrong in the financial crisis, but what we certainly know is that the central banks in particular thought that risk was being distributed widely when it was being concentrated very, very, uh, extremely within the financial system and central banks thought they could mop up any problems in one bank with interest rate cuts and, and some action, some liquidity action and didn't realise how systemic the crisis could be and thought that bubbles really didn't exist uh, because efficient market hypothesis suggests they don't really exist. But there were loads of strands of economics that said there were loads of very neoclassical people like Raghu Rajan in 2005 said to the American Economics Association right at the heart, no, it was at, it was at um, the um, uh, Central Bankers Conference in the world, said this is all nonsense. So the voices were there, they just weren't listened to. So uh, that it was within the sort of the paradigm of neoclassical economics that there were there were loads of voices if you'd wanted to listen to them saying this system is not sustainable i don't know how it, loads of people said the american housing market was in a, in trouble at that time it's, that wasn't that wasn't in any way a uh, an outlandish view so i think to pick on you know, there is no doubt that in policy making there was groupthink and it was disastrous. Uh, to say that that applies to all forms of economics, I think, is going too far. Okay, um, Miata, do you want to maybe pick up on the accessibility point or other yeah, others? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the point you make on diversity is completely right. Um, and I, I generally think one of the challenges, so to, you know, uh, I was provocative in my irrelevance or extinction uh, point, but we got to make economics more accessible to people um, and I think there has you know what you, you could all wonder if it's almost a conspiracy where actually it's very complicated jargon and language is used to create this sort of mystique around this profession so that people perhaps don't challenge it and the, uh, challenge the assumptions around it we've got to break that up because in the end all economists are trying to do 
is understand the world in which we exist in and understand the interaction. Um, and unless we can explain that in simple terms, and actually I think this is a space in which economists can win over the public, mm -hmm. because if you can start just talking very simply and ditching the jargon and explaining some of these complex issues in very simple ways that people can understand because it relates to their day to day, then I think that actually some of the assumptions and some of the ways in which economists work, people might have more sympathy for, or at least understand it a little bit more. So for me, a big part of the accessibility is, let's change the language, let's make it completely relatable to people, and actually encourage people to engage in the debate as equals, because actually the insights you bring from your day-to-day -day life is as valid as the models that are made up based on numbers, quite frankly. Um, and the more that we can do that, the more you can make it and that's part of the point about democratizing, I think, economics, the more, I think, legitimacy the profession perhaps gets because people will get it and understand it and understand maybe why some of the assumptions are right and some of the assumptions are wrong. Okay. Um, and, and Joe, do you want to pick up on the point about rigor? Yeah. Um, I think rigor it has two kind of meanings. And so the kind of rigor I'm against is the rigor which means if it's not neoclassical economics, it's not rigorous. Um, and the rigor I'm for is the kind of, you know, high academic standards, critical, analytic, um, you know, and challenging. And I think, you know, Chris does that. And I think lots of economists do do that. Um, and as I stressed at the start, it's definitely not saying, you know, we need to abolish neoclassical economics. It's, it's just that we need to be better at knowing what neoclassical economics is really good at and what it's not so good at um, and uh, finding uh, and, and developing too because I think other perspectives suffer from a real lack of, of development because of how university economics departments have become. Um, so yeah, on that. And then I think also just to quickly touch on the marginalised groups and Chris's point about stopping the charlatans winning. Um, I think something Economy did in their schools workshops with primary school kids is ask people to draw an economist and they draw uh, men with, um, with monocles and top hats. Um, and you, you, know, you see how quick, quickly uh, people, children, internalise pictures of, of who an economist is. And so I think, you know, really challenging that and changing that from a very early age. And I think that comes to the point about stopping the charlatans winning is that because people don't identify with economics and because people don't feel like they can engage with economics, they have no grounds of, for choosing between uh, the good campaign, the good, the good analytic, high standard economists and the people who are just making things up. Um, and I think economists do recognise that after Brexit, but the, the risk is that they go out and they say, here's what we know, you should know it too, and then you'll make the right decisions. Um, and I think if that happens, it will only increase the kind of wedge between most people and economists. And it has to be much more, here's what we know. What, what do you know about your economic reality and what can we learn from that? Mary Poppins has got a lot to answer for. Okay, <laughs> okay we've got a lot of hands. So if, you, if I do come to you, please try and be quick. So let's go here first. Um, so just behind you and then to you. <laughs> uh, Sue Cameron total non-economist. Can I ask, um, I absolutely agree with and understand the disconnect between ordinary people who don't understand most of it, like me, and uh, the, the mega stats. But is this revolution in government economics merely a PR exercise, basically? And if it is something more than that, what kind of difference might it make to policy decisions? And secondly, Chris said he didn't think much of the idea of lay advisory committees, and I agree with him. But should we uh, make teaching about trade-offs in government, economic and other trade-offs, a compulsory subject in all schools, starting perhaps in primary schools, so the next generation can be much better consumers of politics and indeed economics. Okay, um, and in front of you, just want to start it. 
uh, Paul, Paul Hodges. Um, I think there's a bit of a backstory with this, and I'd like to pick up your starting point, Emily, mm. where you talked about coming into history and dealing with different ways of trying to make sense of the world. Because if we go back to the origins of GDP and the origins of economics, as I understand them, you're really going back to Roosevelt trying to make sense of the Great Depression. And, you know, you needed to understand what was happening to the economy. Nobody did. And that's why the Fed GDP numbers start when they do. Now, if you move forward today, I would argue GDP is actually irrelevant to our issues. Because although poor old Modigliani did his stuff about his hypothesis and so on, if you look at the ONS data or the Bureau of Labor Studies data and so on, you see absolutely that spending stops, really, after the age of 55. And so, you know, looking around this audience, I'm afraid about a third of us are completely useless in terms of, of GDP. And given that you know, you know, the majority of people are now, uh, households are headed by people over 55, you're not going to get GDP growth. We wrote about this six or seven years ago, and we're still, are still there with that argument. But if you instead turn the argument around, as uh, Miata said, what is the key issue for ordinary people? They know perfectly well that when you get older, you don't earn as much, but you don't need as much. But they are left now without pensions, because pensions have been cut back. They're left without social security. They're left without help in hospitals. Those are the issues that are absolutely critical to them. Now, LSE published a very good book last week, last year, on the, the, the challenges of the 100-year life. Which we need to get back into retraining. We're no longer being born, educated, working, bit of pension, and then dying. You now get to be 50 or 55, and instead of dying at pension age, which is what happened when I was starting life, that's what people thought, you now have another 20 years. But you don't want to do the same thing that you were doing for 30 years at 55. You get bored with it, for goodness sake. You, physically, you can't do it. So if my argument is, and I'd throw it open to the panel, because I think it fits with all three of what you're saying, is can we get economics back to the basics of trying to make sense of the problems that ordinary people face? Because it, that, if we could do that in an open and honest way, I'd admit that a lot of the areas we don't know, I think we would really strike a chord. Okay, thank you. And we're going to take one here and, and one there. I'll try a quick question. Trevor Lanwan, I was government actuary for six and a half years. I loved the economists I worked with. They were great, and they really helped me. But can I be a charlatan? Has, my question is, who has heard of the Good Judgment Project? Because that is evidence. And that is saying where non-experts can add value to experts. And if you haven't seen it or read about it, you really ought to see it. Because it tells you what's the best type of lay committee to have. It tells you how to get the best forecasts. OK. And hey. Thanks very much. Uh, Henry Lusengor, founder of Promoting Economic Pluralism. Uh, my day job for the last 20 odd plus years has been an uh, economist in, in policy making other in DEFRA and uh, environment agents in the Australia and so on. So I wanted to specifically address the question of is it any worse or better in government economics than academia? And I think in some ways very similar issues pertain because the big issue with academia is the privileging of one way of seeing the world and the marginalisation of others. Uh, that is the, the, the problem we're trying to address with pluralism. Uh, and I think if you look at, um, say, the government um, social science capacity, uh, firstly, you'll find that the head of the social science capacity in all departments are chief economists, who are always one grade above uh, any other disciplinary uh, uh, person. I think that's a, a obvious sort of uh, issue. Um, secondly, the, in terms of the proportion of analysts, uh, the majority by far are, are economists, all trained uh, as neoclassical economists. And given that actually here, I would say, in uh, universities, um, interdisciplinary centers are really where a lot of the interesting work is doing dealing with real issues, which tend to involve multi-dimensions. And actually, funny enough there, there aren't so many economists because they tend to not engage with interdisciplinary work. Um, so actually, I think the reform is to move to more an even uh, interdisciplinary approach to wicked complex issues, which are the big policy issues. And I don't think that's really happening to any great extent uh, in government. Uh, 
so I think behavioral economics is about as good as it gets, uh, and that can that's just a sort of place to put lots of things. Okay, so a lot to pick up on there from our panel. We've got interdisciplinarity, good judgment project, if anyone's heard of that, um, uh, retraining later in life, and um, how would this actually change things? So if you can respond to any of those um, and also give us your kind of uh, closing comments and we can continue our discussion over wine. Uh, so Joe, if you want to go first. Uh, yeah, well, I think, I guess it kind of picks up a bit of this, okay, is the kind of stuff happening in government in the Bank of England, a PR exercise, um, or if it isn't, does it risk, you know, self-selecting um, usual candidates or does it kind of uh, and I think these are all risks and I think you know we have no plan we have no kind of details about what the Bank of England are doing um, but I think they are I guess opportunities and I think there are you know there are people who have lots of experience with deliberative kind of democracy and facilitation and I think you know it's a, it's the start and going back to that question of how do you kind of close this divide it's it's part of doing that. It's part of saying, um, as a citizen, I think I would definitely use citizen as opposed to consumer of political politics and economics. You have a role to play. Um, and uh, of course, I would see this as a, as a long cultural shift, um, not something that happens overnight. Um, and I think it involves, you know, primary school and secondary school education. I think it's, again, to stress that point, it's really important that the education isn't um, kind of the education we receive at undergraduate level. It's really important that it is much more rooted in people's everyday lives. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it, it's, it could be the start. And I think we have to be wary of, of kind of PR exercises. Um, but I think it, it's something that has to be kept going now for the for the long run, um, for it to have you know really big, large scale kind of changes. And for me, it's not about what different kind of what concrete changes to policy we'd see, because it's much more about the process, about how policy is made than about the outcome. Um, people might decide to do you know I don't know what people decide to do, but I think it's important that they are part of that. And I th I think that's. Um, the exciting possibility. Um, just very quickly, in terms of interdisciplinary, I'm all in favour of eco economists talking to other disciplines. This is all about an intellectual exercise about trying to find the right answers to problems. And if you don't, and if you don't think that any other discipline has anything to say, then you are, have a very obviously far too closed mind. Uh, in terms of is some of the revolution in government thinking a PR exercise? I think it, I fear that, as, as I said, I think it is. I do think we should try and encourage uh, schools to not necessarily teach economics or trade-offs, but just critical evaluation of stuff. Just something much more basic, you know, particularly you know, coming from a news background, just understanding if you read a news article whether it's even vaguely true or not, you know, which uh, that's pretty important in a modern world. I hadn't heard of the Good Judgment Project and I'd be very interested to know if there's ways that, ways that it could be done better to make it not a PR exercise. And just finally, I get slightly irritated when people have a go at GDP, not because I love GDP or I love reporting GDP, uh, but if you were a Martian and you came down to Britain in 2018, and took one look at the GDP statistics for the last 50 years, and you looked at what happened in the GDP statistics, not even GDP per head, just the GDP statistics, you'd have said people are going to be really irritated in this country. They think their personal lives would not be very good. You've had a terrible decade. It's going to be a really difficult political situation. People are going to be angry with whoever's in charge of this country. GDP is perfect at telling us that we've had a terrible de decade. It's a great summary statistic. It doesn't get much wrong. And there are known errors with it, which we all can go into. And so you've got to be very careful with its use, I don't suggest. But in terms of it doesn't tell us what's been going on, it's told us exactly how annoyed people should be uh, with their personal circumstances on the ground in their real daily lives. <laughs>
so I agree. <laughs> I agree with the, I think a lot of the comments that were made um, in the sort of final set of contributions. I mean. Is it PR exercise? Uh, well, maybe I'm a bit more sympathetic. I think it's probably responding to a genuine concern about legitimacy um, and legitimacy in the public eye. Um, and I think that should be um, commended. Um, in terms of what sort of policy decisions it might uh, foster, actually, I think the gentleman's contribution here answers that question, which is it takes us back to what are the issues that are affecting people's lives that we need to respond and answer to. Because if you can get your problem definition right and actually understand what problems we should be trying to fix, then your policy making flows much strongly from that. So I think the, the, the entire logic of flipping it around is let's get back to the things that matter, because actually that's all economists are trying to do and ought to be trying to do. And if you're dislocated from the people who you're trying to figure out what matters to, you've got a problem there. Um, and, and I think that inevitably takes us down a more interdisciplinary approach, because these are very, very complex issues. It's, for no, you know, it's not a coincidence that we haven't cracked any of these wicked issues because you know and I'm an economist but I try to keep that quiet um, I try and keep my PhD in economics quiet but you know one discipline cannot solve it and until you get uh, an acceptance that you need to work across different professions in order to solve complex complex issues I fear we will just be reiterating and repeating the same problems that we're sol failing to solve year in year out a decade from here two decades from here three decades from here and the public appetite for that, I think, reduces more and more, uh, which creates a, a massive uh, problem of legitimacy for the government going forward. Thank you very much. So um, maybe we'll be letting some of you go with a bit more revolutionary fervour in your bellies. Um, uh, so I would just like you to please join me in thanking the panellists and please do stay for a drink. <laughs>